You know, last Sunday, we officially kicked off our spring financial challenge called Forward. And I can tell you that we're already off to a fantastic start, but there's more work for us to do. Again today, you will find a pledge card on your chair. We're giving these to every person at our church across all our sites. The top portion is a financial update that we'd like for you to take home and to read. The bottom section is a pledge card that we'd like you to use as you prayerfully consider how you could help us reach our goal. This spring, we're seeking to raise funds towards debt repayment and our newcomers' refugee ministry. The goal of Forward is $100,000. In addition, we're asking God for a 5% increase in the number of people who regularly give and in what is given. To reach our goal, we will need everyone to participate as we trust God to provide. The challenge is big, but if each of us were able to give just $15 more per month, we'd actually meet our 2024 budget. We can do that. As we move forward in faith, would you express your commitment by checking one of the boxes on your card? And then simply rip the card in two, drop off the pledge portion of the card in the offering box as it's passed around, or in the boxes at the exit doors in Orangeville and on the info table in Shelburne and Grand Valley this week. Or you can bring it back next week. So how will you get involved in helping us reach our goal? Will you start to give regularly? Will you increase your regular giving or will you make an extra one-time gift? You know, there's some specific amounts suggested. If you confidentially check one of those boxes, not only would it help provide accountability for follow through, but it will also help us to track and anticipate and give thanks to God for answered prayer. It's always an act of faith to stretch ourselves financially for the work of God. But as a church, freeing ourselves from capital debt will so empower the work of ministry. And giving towards our newcomers allows us to welcome people fleeing just horrible situations to Compass and to a new life in Canada. Please, pray about how you are going to help us reach our goal. Every gift counts and is so appreciated. Together, let's move forward in everything God is calling us to. Thanks. Good morning, Compass. It is so good to be together and to dig into God's Word together. Whether you're joining us in Grand Valley or in Shelburne, uh, in Orangeville or at home, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, As we come to God's Word this morning, let's just pause and give thanks and ask Him to speak to us. Lord, we do thank you for the gift of your Word. Thank you that you are God who speaks um, not only in history, but you speak into our lives. And so this morning, I pray that Uh, You would challenge us, that you would comfort us, that you would teach us, and that you would establish us in your word so that we might be reflections of you um, to the world around us. So thank you for the gift of community, for the gift of the church, and for the gift of your word. And we pray all this in your wonderful name. Amen. Have you noticed that that who you have on your side makes all the difference in the world. Whether it's in friendship or in professional relationships or sporting events or any great challenge or opportunity, having the right person on your side lightens the load. It improves your chances of success and it provides encouragement for the journey. When you're working on a project or you have Uh, some challenge or opportunity in front of you, having someone with you who has expertise or experience to guide you through, it makes the difference between stumbling in the dark 
and confidently moving forward to success. We've been reading through the book of um, Ezekiel over the last five weeks, and it is a book full of prophecy and full of images and metaphors and visions and promises and proclamations. And one of the real hopes that I have for us as we have been looking through this book is that God will be speaking to you through uh, a part of the Bible that you may not have spent as much time in. Sometimes it's, it's easier or more tempting to go to those familiar passages that we kind of understand and we come to a book like Ezekiel and it, it seems a little bit beyond us. But this is all God's word and God has the opportunity to speak to us about who he is, about his love and his faithfulness about his holiness and about his challenge to us and his invitation to us. And I hope that you've seen that. But I also hope that you've seen that biblical prophecy is about more than predicting what will happen. It's about proclaiming who is on your side. In Ezekiel's time, as we've seen, the people were facing a really uncertain future. They were staring down the threat that was for, uh, coming against their safety and security. The nations around them were planning for war. And the battle wasn't just physical, it was also spiritual, and it was very, very real. It, it was inward and it was outward. And in their faith, they had wandered far from God. And now when things seemed to be falling apart, God seemed far, far away. And that's because they had run after the cultures of their day. They had been taken in by the trappings of their society. They'd been sucked down by them and sidelined by selfishness and spiritual indifference. They had given their time and their money and their affections and their attentions to things other than God. We, we sometimes keep God at its arm's length as well. We get taken in by other things, other temptations, other things that vie for our attention and our worship. And then when the world begins to fall apart, when, there, when we see violence and chaos and despair, we too can feel very much alone and vulnerable. What threats are you facing? Are there external threats? Like you really need a new job or health concerns, or financial debt, struggles in the workplace, difficulties at home. Maybe you're dealing with internal threats, walking in grief, consumed by worry or sadness or guilt. Those are no less real than an army gathering at the border. Do you feel vulnerable or afraid or overwhelmed? Maybe spiritually distant? Can you name the threat? Maybe it's more like an opportunity for you. There's a challenge that you'd love to take on, but you feel like maybe it's more than you can handle. The people may have wanted Ezekiel to come along and tell them that it's all going to be okay. The threat's not real. What they're facing isn't so much. It's going to work out. It, and really, that's what we all want, right? Don't worry about it. For the problems to go away, even if it's just for a little while. So we don't have to think about it or deal with it. But God doesn't give them such a fanciful or utopian response because it's fake. And God is fully grounded in truth and reality. For them, it looked like war was coming, and it came. The threat of being conquered and exiled happened. It came to pass. God didn't stop the consequences of sin, nor did he take people out of the temporary suffering of their circumstances. God does something far more heroic. He joins them in the midst of their trouble. Jesus himself says in John 16, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
for I have overcome the world. Jesus is the light in the darkness. He's the cleft in the rock in the midst of the storm. He's the one who prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And yes, his promises are true. Don't doubt it for a minute. One day, exile will end. Justice will be established. Love does win. One day, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain. For the one who is seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. But until that day comes, the same God who secures our future joins us in the present. And he suffers with us. And he gives us what we need so that we can trust him to be victorious and faithful. He is on our side and it makes a world of difference. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34, last week with Jay, we were looking at chapter 33. And as we come to 34, we're making a bit of a pivot, a bit of a transition to the last part of the book. You may remember that the, the book of Ezekiel starts with God's commissioning for the prophet. It's dramatic, it's incredible. The prophet's being prepared, Ezekiel's being sent to warn the people and to call them to seek God while they can. But they refuse the invitation, and then we are ushered into the middle or the largest portion of the book, which is filled with all kinds of of judgments and consequences of their sin and their selfishness. And their enemies mock them and their leaders become corrupt and their society crumbles. It's because as the people of God, they have not remained close to him. And God gives them over to the desires of their heart and the result is devastating. The land is conquered. They're carried off into exile. Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. Philosopher and author Will Durant has famously observed a great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself within. That is where these people find themselves. And we also see ourselves in the reflection of Scripture. Then comes the turning point. The turning point to the whole book in this final section. If by chance you were a fan of early 80s professional wrestling, which I will admit is an acquired taste, you'll understand the point I'm about to make. There's always that point in the match when the the fan favorite, the babyface wrestler, is getting soundly defeated by the wrestler playing the heel. It looks bleak. Defeat is imminent. Sometimes there's a whole gang of villains teaming up at one, against one person at, one, at the same time. And then all of a sudden, the lights change. The walk-up music comes on. Pyrotechnics go off. And out of nowhere, the hero comes running in to help his fallen friend. And all of a sudden... The threats are eliminated one by one, over the top rope, uh, a finishing move here, uh, finally a pin, and as the match ends, the hero is standing in the middle of the ring with his friend armed raised in victory. Now I know that there are far more credible ways to make a point here, but you get what I'm saying. We need a hero. We need someone to come in. We need someone to show up. We need someone on our side. And in Ezekiel 34, that's exactly what God does. Chapter after chapter after chapter of judgment and doom and woe and worry. And the whole time God is there and finally he just steps up and says, trust me. This is what I'm going to do. And Ezekiel 34 starts with God bringing an indictment against the political and spiritual leaders. He says, you were supposed to take care of the people. You only take care of yourselves. They ignored the sick and the injured and the hungry while they themselves were fed and clothed and satisfied. 
They completely disregarded the social side of the gospel. Yes, God cares for our souls, but he also cares about whether you have food in your stomach. We do the compass run for food, and when we do so, we're not just trying to do something good, kind of an add-on, a nicety to the gospel or, or a PR piece. Caring for people's physical needs is a foundational outworking of the gospel. It's proof that we have been saved and that Christ is at work within us. We are declaring that God cares for the whole person. That each person that we meet is an image bearer, reflective of God and worth of, and worth of dignity and care. And while we can't miraculously feed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes like Jesus did, we can address hunger and food insecurity across our region by working together in the name of Jesus to do the things that Jesus would do if Jesus himself were here. And it is no less miraculous. In verse 6, we see these false prophets. They don't protect the sheep And they don't go after the ones who've wandered away. They just let them go. So the Lord says, I'm against the shepherds and I will hold them accountable for the flock. And this is when the lights change and the music comes on. Verse 11, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. I'm going to do it. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. And I'm going to highlight three verses this morning. The first one is this. I will, my myself will search for my sheep and look after them. This one's worth highlighting and writing down as are the other ones. Because it's God personally saying, I'm going to show up. And I'm going to look after you. And it makes all the difference in the world. Just look at what flows out of this statement about what he's going to do. The action words that follow. Verse 12 I will rescue them. Verse 13, I will bring them out and I will lead them in. Verse 14, I will feed them. Verse 15, I will tend them. Verse 16, I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. This chapter is is a fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 41 where God says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And look at the result here in in Ezekiel 34, 14. They will lie down in good grazing, in good grazing land. They will eat and rest and will recover. My, uh, My brother is a farmer. And he has just built an incredibly new dairy barn with all kinds of technology and equipment and robots. And it's amazing. And whenever we go to visit, we, we usually get a barn tour um, just to see what's happening. And what gets him most excited? And I go on, we walk around because I love to see how excited he gets about what's going on. But what gets him most excited is, is not the technology. It's, it's not the equipment. It's the cows. He says, just look at them. They're all lying down. The whole barn is lying down. And why that matters is because they only lie down when they feel satisfied and safe and cool and protected and fed. And it's when they're lying down that they are most productive. Tells us something about our own circumstances and situations as well. When we are protected, when we know that God is with us, we will lie down in safety and feel secure. The invitation of Ezekiel 34 is this. Find assurance. Embrace God's presence. What would that look like in your life? For you to embrace the presence of God. In your current circumstances, to embrace his presence and find your assurance in him. Notice it's God who's taking the initiative to seek out and save the lost sheep. He loves his flock. He's showing compassion to the vulnerable and strengthening those who are weak. He's he's present and he's active. And we simply need to embrace his presence, become aware that it is there, that he is there. Christian missionary and author Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband was martyred 
for his faith in the jungles of South America once wrote this, the secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. In the comforting embrace of God's presence, we find assurance and we find security, just like a shepherd guiding and protecting his flock. We simply need to learn how to lean into his presence and find our strength and confidence in every season of life, regardless of our circumstances. Earlier, I asked you to think about what threat you were facing and asking you just to identify that. And now it seems like you like you in, to think about in light of Ezekiel 34, imagine how God, what God might say to you. If God were standing with you right now in face of the threat that, you're, that you've identified, what would he say? Just let this chapter be a reminder to you of the true contentment that is found not in changing your circumstances, but in embracing your God and his presence in the midst of them. God is present with you this morning. He's with you in the midst of all that you're facing and he's not going to leave and you can have comfort and assurance in his presence. Now turn over to chapter 36. In chapter 36, just a few pages to your right, God begins to give us another invitation. He's already invited us to find our assurance by embracing his presence and now he invites us to fuel our expectations by trusting in his promises. Start reading with me from verse 24. Isaiah 36, verse 24, it says this, for I will take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and I will bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave to your ancestors and you will be my people and I will be your God. God is saying, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how long you've been gone or how long you've been away, or where you've been, just come home. Out of all the places, I'm going to gather you. I'm going to gather you to myself. Turn around and come back to me. This is a prophecy, a promise that is all about salvation. It's all about restoration. It confronts the lie that God can't forgive you, that God can't turn your circumstances around, or that God won't. These words are the words that the prodigal son needed to hear as he stood in the pig pen contemplating whether or not he should go back to his father's home. Should I go? Would I, would I, would I even be accepted as a slave? And Jesus tells us in the story of the prodigal son that while he was still a long way off, the father looked and saw him and ran to him and kissed him, and embraced him, and blessed him, and welcomed him home. And then he went through a whole process of restoration of sonship, just affirming that you are my child, and I love you. That's what's happening here to the nations. God's saying, I will bring you out, and I will bring you home. Trust in my promises. Salvation is a totally God-initiated endeavor. He doesn't leave us in the pig pen, covered in filth and guilt and shame. He provides a way home. In verse 25, he says, I will sprinkle you with clean water. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. You will be clean. Sin will no longer be your master and you can walk free. This is the promise of the gospel. And God removes the one God is the one who removes the heart of stone, the lifeless heart, the hardened heart, and he replaces it with a heart of flesh that is alive and responsive. This is a metaphor for regeneration, being made spiritually alive in Christ, and it's what salvation makes possible. 
God's sovereignty, his absolute control in our salvation and in providing our salvation is a profound expression of his love and his grace for us. Despite our shortcomings, despite our history, God chooses to redeem us through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And our salvation is not based on our own efforts, but on God's sovereign will and love and undeserved favor. He promises a new heart. And this transformation from within, this replacing of a hardened heart with one that is open and receptive and loving is the very thing that the gospel is about. Author Tim Keller puts it this way, the Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. Yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. In Christ, I am totally guilty and entirely forgiven. I am utterly lost and completely found. I am fully known and truly loved. When the people in Ezekiel's time heard the promises of God to restore them, to bring them home, to give them uh, a future and to give them hope, to use them, as part of, to, be, to use them as part of his redemptive plan, I am sure that they were filled with joy and expectation. And they were not disappointed. Even though they couldn't see it yet. From where they were, from their vantage point, things had not changed. They took hold of the promises with expectation. And every one of those promises that God gave was fulfilled. Romans 5.5 5 declares, And this hope will not lead to disappointment. God's not going to lift you up just to let you down. For we know how dearly God loves us and he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. If there is an area in your life where you are struggling to trust God, I'm telling you he is faithful and he is with you. You can trust him. Just allow your expectation to be fueled by the certainty of the promises of God's word. Here's a little exercise that I did this week that I want to recommend that you try. Take about 15 minutes and just take your Bible and a piece of paper or fire up your computer or your phone. And here's what I want you to do. Just start to write down the promises that God has made in his word that come to mind. From what you know about God, what would you write? What is God like? What has he promised to do for you? And just start to write them down, what you know to be true about God, maybe what you've already seen happen in your life. What are the things that you believe or you say you believe about God? And just kind of write them down, just a bunch of jot notes. And then take what you've written down and and craft it into one or two paragraphs where you summarize um, um, what are these promises? And summarize it in a way that you're, you're going to declare that these are true and that you're going to trust in them. And then just let it build and fuel your expectation. What you're doing is you're declaring the goodness and the character of God. And you're speaking a, a, a lesson to your own soul. And I'd love to, to challenge you this week to write up your own. I'm going to share with you what I came up with this week. Just type it out and then every day read it out. Spend some time thinking about it and declaring to God that you trust in him. Here's what I came up with. I declare that I will trust in God's promises even in difficult times. He is my rock. He is my protector, shield, and the power that saves me. He is my place of safety, my refuge, my my savior. I will enjoy his friendship and rest in his relentless, unfailing love. In my heart, I rejoice in his salvation through Jesus alone. I place my trust in his sovereign power, for he will bring to pass everything he has promised me. I declare that God is ever present with me wherever I go. I will not be stranded in life for God is making a way for me where there seems to be no way. I trust that his plans and purposes for me will be fulfilled for he seals me with his mighty 
with his mighty name and rescue me from the hands of those who are too strong for me. I choose to trust him over my fears because I have a God who is with me in the present and who holds eternity in his hands. He fills me with joy and peace. His promises are true. Therefore, my heart will overflow with hope. This is the promise. I'm telling you, that'll carry you through the day. Every one of those promises flows out of the word of God. Now your declaration may be way shorter. It may be way simpler, but it'll be no less profound. Just let God inform you of who he is and let him fuel your expectation of how you can trust in him. It's an exercise worth doing. By the way, keep the context in mind in which God was asking them to trust and hope in them. Things were only getting worse and worse and worse until finally at the end of chapter 33, Ezekiel is told the city has fallen, the glory has departed. It's over. It's hopeless, people. But then chapter 34 comes along and God shows up and he gives his devastated people a reason to hope. He invites them to find assurance by embracing his presence. And in verse 36, he fuels their expectations by saying, you can trust in my promises. And finally, we come to Ezekiel 37, where God invites them to experience renewal by harnessing God's power. And I want you to turn over there in your Bible, Ezekiel 37. It's a declaration. It describes a vision that God gives to the prophet. Maybe this is the only passage from Ezekiel that you actually were familiar with before. But it's really a vision about what he's going to do to bring the nation back to life. And in Ezekiel 37, 1, it begins, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and I saw that there was a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Always a good answer. (laughs) Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come alive. I will attach tendons to you and will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put my breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel's vision, in his vision, he sees this valley of dry bones symbolizing their hopelessness and their despair. And these bones, we're told, are very dry. They had been like this for a long time time. Maybe that's how you feel this morning. Like it's been a long, dry time. And God's question is simply, Ezekiel, do you believe that these bones can live again? He challenges him to believe in God's power to do it, to bring life out of dryness and restoration out of ruin. I love this quote from Beth Moore in her study on Ezekiel. She says, God is the only one who can make the valley of trouble a door of hope. He can do it. In the book, The The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis introduces us to four children who, who find their way into a wondrous land through the back of a wardrobe closet in their uncle's house. And the children enter this magical land called Darnia with rolling hills and towering mountains and beautiful forests. And, and it's populated by the most remarkable beasts, all who can speak. However, they also find that the land is covered with snow, cursed by a, a perpetual winter. And then we're introduced to a wicked queen and she holds the entire land under her spell. Lastly, we're introduced to a lion. His name is Aslan. And he is a mysterious, wondrous beast who has come from beyond Narnia, from beyond time. Aslan, throughout the Chronicles of Narnia, is the Christ figure. He represents Jesus, and eventually he lays his life down for Narnia. He dies on a stone table and then rises again in even more glorious 
and majestic than ever. And in his risen state, in his majestic state, he proceeds to begin to reverse the curse that has come upon the land. And towards the end of the story, he leads a bunch of a troop of liberators into a castle where the wicked queen was and, and uh, stayed. And she, he finds this courtroom and this courtyard, and it is strewn with stone statues. And these statues were the creatures that had been turned to stone by the curse of the wicked witch. And as he strides into the castle, you wonder, how on earth is he going to free those who've been turned to stone? And we find out immediately, because the great beast strides up to the first of these statues, lowers his head, and simply breathes. And as the breath of the lion touches the stone, the stone ripples into flesh. And his breath fills the lungs of those who were once stone. And they awaken and they begin to sing and dance and shout for the glories of the one who has freed them, Aslan, the great and mighty one. Lewis is explaining for us, he's illustrating that incredible moment of redemption, that moment when God turns our hearts of stones into hearts of flesh, when he brings death out of, uh, when he brings life out of death. He's recalling the promise made here in Ezekiel 36 and the power that is explained in Ezekiel 37 where God says this, I will put my breath in you and you will come to life. God is the giver of life. The word breath here can also be translated wind or spirit. It's the same spirit that was breathed into Adam at creation. It's the same spirit that came upon the church in the upper room after the resurrection of Jesus. And Ezekiel begins this prophecy over the, bio, the, valley, over the bones in the valley. And at first, nothing happened. But slowly, as the power of God, as the breath of God fell upon them, they are restored and they come to life. This is a prophecy about what God is doing in the nation. It's a prophecy about what God is doing in history. It's a prophecy about what God does in the life of everyone who believes and trusts in him for salvation. And it is a prophecy about what God can do in your life today. You simply need to ask for his life-giving power. And the chapter ends with a promise that God will unite and restore the nation under a king like David. This is a reference to Jesus, the one who will make all this possible. In verse 26, God says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant and I will establish them and increase their numbers. I will put my sanctuary among them, my dwelling place, and I will be their God and they will be my people. This is the promise that ripples all the way through scripture. This is what God is doing. So what does it mean for us? It means that sin and circumstances can come in and make you feel like the walking dead. Physically alive, but spiritually a heart of stone. The good news is that through his presence and his promise and his power, Jesus Christ can make you come alive again. We can have that new life. The presence of God brings us comfort and reassurance in times of uncertainty. The promises of God instill in us hope and anticipation of what is to come. And the power of God is transformative. It brings renewal and new beginnings into our lives. And so this week, I challenge you to remember to embrace God's presence. To trust and to take hold of his promises and to harness his power. Because in doing so, you will walk in the fullness of his grace and experience the abundant life he has promised to all of us, regardless of our circumstances. Who is on your side makes a world of difference. It can make the seemingly impossible task turn into a stunning victory. And I'm telling you, God is on your side today. He is with you. And he is inviting you to trust and to follow him. I want to encourage you uh, to stand with me and we're going to respond to God's word with a prayer of commitment. So let's pray together. God, we just proclaim that you are the one who knows us and who loves us. 
who listens to us and breathes within us new life. You call us into hope this morning. And Lord, we are surrounded by a world of dry bones, a world of despair. And I pray for those this morning who are feeling alone or overwhelmed. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to become aware that you are with us in the midst of our circumstances, that your presence and your promises and your power is at work within us. They are true and we can trust in them. And Lord, would you simply give us the ability to step out in faith and to trust you. Make us fully alive and give us a new heart, I pray. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.